Bona tarda, bones tardes, secretària general de la Universitat de Lleida, president del Consell Social de la nostra Universitat, director de l'Escola Tècnica Superior d'Enginyeria Agrària de la Universitat de Lleida, delegat del Govern de la Generalitat de Catalunya, Ramon Ferrer, dignísimes autoritats acadèmiques i civils, membres de la comunitat universitària, senyores i senyors, benvinguts, bienvenidos a l'acte d'investidura del senyor Ratan Lal com a doctor honoris causa per la Universitat de Lleida. La importància i el valor que la Universitat dona a aquest nomenament, que és el més alt honor que aquesta institució concedeix, es posa de manifest amb la solemnitat d'aquest acte, marcat per un ritual antic i d'un alt valor simbòlic. Tot seguit, la doctora Maria Teresa Areces, secretària general de la Universitat de Lleida, ens legirà l'acte de nomenament del doctor Noris Causa de la nostra universitat a favor del senyor Ratan Lal. El Consell de Govern, en la sessió de 25 d'abril de 2017, d'acord amb els estatuts i la normativa Honoris Causa de la Universitat de Lleida, va aprovar per unanimitat la proposta del Departament de Producció Vegetal i Ciència Forestal i del Departament de Medi Ambient i Ciències del Sol d'investir el senyor Ratan Lal, doctor honoris causa per la Universitat de Lleida, en reconeixement a la seva contribució al progrés de la ciència en l'àmbit del medi ambient i en l'ús i maneig dels sols i aigües. Prego el professor Ildefons Pla, padrí del doctorant, que faci entrar el senyor Ratan Lal. Dono la paraula al doctor Ildefons Pla per tal que ens faci l'elogi dels mèrits del senyor Ratan Lal. Senyor rector, president del Consell Social de la Universitat de Lleida, secretari general de la Universitat, director de l'Escola de Grògoms Forestals, i altres autoritats i professors aquí presents. Per mi és un gran honor fer aquest laudatio del professor Ratan Lal, 
faré en inglés porque él puede entender lo que estoy hablando. Eh, it is for me a pleasure and an honor to make this laudatio of Professor Ratan Lal as a recipient of the Doctorate Honoris Causa of the University of Yale. Myself, I had the privilege to meet him for the first time, although I already knew about his research work the year 1974, more than 40 years ago, in a visit to IITA, International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria, as part of a sabbatical year that I spent partially in West Africa. Since then, we have had a continuous and fluid relation, both at the scientific and personal levels. Also at that time, I met in Africa another good friend of us, both of us, Dr. Eric Ross, who was working with us, Tom, a French research organization in Ivory Coast. The three of us from the same generation have had parallel activities in the same area of research, soil and water conservation, and therefore we have met in many occasions in different meetings around the world. And in all occasions, we have a photo together that remember our friendly relations. Regretfully, this time Eric, who now lives in Montpellier, is not able to accompany us due to his wife's health problems. Going to the curriculum vitae of Dr. Ratan Lal, we see that after difficult times when he was a young fellow, because his family had to move to India from Pakistan, West Punjab, a refugees in 1948, when India and Pakistan became separate countries after being part of the British Empire, But he could continue his studies in India, reaching the Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and the Master of Science in Soils with very high qualifications. That is why he could get afterwards a scholarship to continue his studies for PhD in the Ohio State University in USA. Finishing in 1968, actually it was the same year I got my PhD in the University of California. Without going into many details, for lack of time, after finishing his PhD in Soils, He got a job as senior research fellow at the University of Sydney in Australia. And afterwards, in 1970, he started working as a soil physicist in the IITA, in the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, in Nigeria, where I met him, as I said, in 1974. He remained there at the end as coordinator of the farming system program. In the year 1978, I invited him together with Dr. Eric Roos as visiting professor in the postgraduate master and doctor program of soil science that I have just organized in the Central University of Venezuela in Maracay, where I was working at that time. Their great experience on management of tropical soils was very appreciated by our graduate students, and they also enjoyed the field trip we did across Venezuela looking at different problems related to soil and water management under tropical conditions. Of course, under very different circumstances to the sad ones that Venezuela suffered today. I had also the opportunity to visit Ratan several times as invited research at IITA. From all those visits, I realized that under the very difficult living conditions in Nigeria, although IITA had all facilities but in a very close and isolated location, He was able to work very hard, doing research related to the problems that he could see in the surrounding areas and the problems, uh, and the problems he had been familiar in his native India. And all that, according to my opinion, had a decisive and lasting influence on the kind, orientation, and approaches of his future research. Looking again at his curriculum vitae, we might appreciate that he has been very prolific in publications hundreds of them, in a number and quality that indicates the great time dedicated to it by Ratan, especially after moving in 1987, not without some immigration difficulties. Actually, he had to wait, he told me, three, day, three years because of his origin to get, uh, to be able to be a professor of the Ohio State University where he got his PhD back in 1968. Although all his research has been always directed to solve problems of soil and water management of agricultural soils, very early he realized the importance of the organic component of the soil on the soil quality related to agricultural production and environmental protection. When the topic of climate change, and specifically the global warming effect of the so-called greenhouse gases, became an important issue at world level, he was one of the first to call the attention of the influence that the soil carbon reserves 
especially in the organic matter component, and not only, but could have both in the increase of mitigation of global warming. As a result of this, he created the first carbon management and sequestration center of the world in the Ohio State University, being its director up to now. Nowadays, there is a very, it's very popular to talk about carbon sequestration, and that is done a mostly speculative, sometimes an isolated research in that direction, having in most of the cases as the unique and last objective the carbon retention or increase in the soil. We are taking into consideration many other interrelated factors that could lead to a scarce application of the results, and worst of all, to some contradictory or non-sustainable effects. But as an example of that, is the present boom in research about the use of biocar as an effective way to sequester carbon. Instead of this, in all the research done and directed by Ratan Lal, he has always emphasized the influence of soil and land management on the carbon budgets, considering that the best way to contribute to sustainable carbon sequestration is the soil, in the soil are good management practices, not only with the objective to increase the carbon in the soil, but also to improve their sustainable productivity. That is why many of the publications or his publication lectures in the last year have been focused not only in the relation of soil carbon sequestration with climate change, but to relation of them with food production and food security. For that, his experience in his native country, India, and in African country has been very important. Besides the enormous research work on those very important issues, Ratan Lal has dedicated much time and efforts to the formation and orientation of many students, especially a PhD student, and to make a wide diffusion of the results of his research in numerous publications at different levels, in a way that they could be understood by scientists in different related research areas, and even by the decision makers. He has made a lot of dedicated to decision makers. That is why he is probably the most consulted and cited author in publications on very different topics of soil and water conservation and degradation, affecting climate change, food production, and environmental protection. As a result, he has been invited to give many lectures all around the world, and he has occupied many leading positions in different world organizations, like the presidency of WASWAC, of ISTRO, of the American Society of Soils, Science and now the presidency at this moment of the International Union of Soil Science, the USS, that will have the next World Congress in Brazil in next year. Among those responsibilities, he was also a member of the work group of IPCC, Intergo Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, between 93, 1993 and 1996. As a such, he was one of the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize Certificate in 2007. He has received many other honors, like the Burlow Award and the Hugh Hammond Bennett Award, one for the contribution to reduce food problems and the other for the contribution to the soil and water conservation. And he has also received the Doctor in Science Honoris Causa from universities in Germany, Moldova, Norway, and India. Now, already retired, he is Distinguished Professor of Soil Science of the Ohio State University. And even with some limiting health problems, he keeps active in writing articles and editing books, all dedicated to emphasize the importance of soils and their wise use and management at worldwide level, to mitigate climate changes and to provide the increased food requirements of the world population. A giving lectures like the one he gave yesterday in the opening here of our CONSOA conference. I want to finish this audio saying that the, UDL, the University of Lleida is honoring a man that has dedicated all his life to continuous research activities in soil and water management under global change. This is the topic of our CONSOA conference during this week at, in the University of Lleida, always with a very open and non-dogmatic orientation interpretation and diffusion through numerous publications and directed to solve the most important present and future problems of the world population related with interaction of climate change, food production, and environmental protection. Thank you.
Moltes gràcies, doctor Pla. I ara dono la paraula al doctor Narciso Pastor, director de l'Escola Tècnica Superior d'Enginyeria Agrària de la nostra universitat, per tal que faci la sol·licitud formal d'incorporació al claustre de professors del senyor Ratal Dau. Magnífic rector, secretària general, president del Consell Social, doctor Ildefonso Pla, doctor de Tanglau, doctor del director, perdó, del Departament de Medi Ambient i Ciències del Sol, director del Departament de Producció Vegetal, Ciència Forestal, Autoritats, claustre de professors, estudiants, PAS, senyores i senyors. Per a l'Escola Tècnica Superior d'Enginyeria Agrària és un veritable honor poder incloure en el seu claustre de professors a una persona de prestigi, un professional honest i molt destacat en el seu àmbit de treball, com és el doctor Ratan Lal. Per a nosaltres és, sense cap mena de dubte, motiu de gran satisfacció i agraïment, agraïment al rector, agraïment a l'equip de govern de la Universitat que ha fet possible la petició del Departament de Medi Ambient i Ciències del Sol i el Departament de Producció Vegetal i Ciències Forestals i també de la nostra escola, i també agraïment al doctor Ratan Lal per acceptar compartir amb nosaltres i els nostres estudiants la seva saviesa, la seva experiència i els seus projectes, que a partir d'ara també són els nostres. Com sabeu, l'Escola Tècnica Superior d'Enginyeria Agrària ha recorregut un llarg camí de més de 45 anys gràcies a l'esforç de molta gent, la qual cosa ha permès situar la nostra escola com referent en l'àmbit agroalimentari i forestal tant a nivell nacional com internacional. Nosaltres som hereus d'aquest gran llegat, però també de la responsabilitat d'honrar-lo i, per tant, d'assumir el compromís de fer-lo més gran. Sent conscients de tot el camí recorregut durant aquests anys, però especialment de tot aquell que encara ens queda per recórrer. The University of Lleida, or more especially, the School of Agri-Food and Forestry Science and Engineering carry out research and teaching in areas of soil and water conservation, carbon sequestration, climate change effects, and land sustainable development and adaptation. Areas, Dr. Rattan, at which you are a reference. This is the reason we need persons like you, Dr. Rattan, your fair commitment, your expertise, and your worldview to help us broaden our knowledge in these areas and respond to the challenges posed by our changes times. Las magníficas y merescudas palabras del doctor Ildefonso Pla han deixat total constancia de las virtuds de la persona que avui ens honra en la seva presència. Per això, dignísimes autoritats acadèmiques i claustrals, considerats tots els arguments i exposats tots els fets, Sol·licito amb tota consideració i prego s'atorgui al doctor Ratan Lal el grau de doctor honoris causa per la Universitat de Lleida. Moltes gràcies. Demano a tots els assistents que es posin dempeus per tal d'iniciar el solemne acte d'investidura. de la Universitat de Lleida i com a homenatge als vostres mèrits rellevants heu estat nomenat doctor honoris causa d'aquesta universitat. Per l'autoritat que m'ha estat otorgada us dono l'esmentat títol 
i us imposo com a símbol el birret distintiu venerat del nostre més alt magisteri. Porteu-lo per coronar els vostres estudis i mereixements. Rebeu l'anell que els antics lliuraven amb aquesta vella cerimònia com a emblema del privilegi de signar dictàmens, consultes i censures que pertoquessin la vostra ciència i professió. I també els guants blancs, símbol de la puresa que han de conservar les vostres mans i que són també signe de la vostra dignitat. Incorporat ja al nostre claustre, rebeu ara, doctor Ratan Lal, el nom de tots els claustrals, una abraçada de fraternitat dels que s'honoren i es congratulen de ser els vostres germans i companys. Prego al doctor Ratan Lal que pronunciï el seu discurs d'acceptació de formar part de la nostra universitat. Mr. Rector, Professor Roberto Fernández, Professor Ildefonso Placentis, Dean Narciso Oster, Vice Rector Astrid Ballesta, Department Head Jose Antonio, Protocol Officer Delphi Roberto. First of all, I like to mention that this has been the greatest honor of my professional career. I have had not experienced the welcome, the privilege, and the honor that you bestow. I am truly privileged and honored and very grateful for this. I thank you all. I also wanted to mention that uh, Professor Placentis, not only for the last 43 years, is a friend, a colleague, but also an excellent scientist in many aspects of soil salinity soil structure, soil physical properties, and it has been a privilege and honor to know him and hope that this cooperation will continue. I also want to thank uh, his family, um, Mrs. Pla and his son. They have been very kind, very gracious host, and I really appreciate that. I wanted to mention that. I hope that this event will strengthen cooperation between my home institution, the Ohio State University, and your prestigious University of Reda. A 700-year-old history is something very unique, and we are privileged to have that relation. I would like to make a few remarks, and I want to mention again that soil health and its importance have been recognized by humanity for millennia. The Bible, depicts Moses stating around circa 1400 BC 
as he and his disciples entered Canaan, and he stated, see what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some fruit of the land. Bible number 13, 1820. So it has been a <coughs> journey by humanity and it's not a destination because the destination keeps changing with every generation and the journey which is important. And an example of that journey came from a Spanish philosopher from Cordoba who was named Ibn al-Awam and during 12th century he wrote a book, Kitab al-Falaha. Those who understand will uh, understand the meaning book on agriculture. And he said in the chapter on soil, the first step in the science of agriculture is the recognition of soils and of how to distinguish that which is of good quality and that which is of inferior quality. He who does not possess this knowledge lacks the first principles and deserve to be regarded as ignorant. One must also take into consideration the depth of the soil, for it often happens that the surface layer may be black. And now we understand why the surface layer of a fertile soil is black. The importance of soil health to global issues of the 21st century has enhanced now than ever before, and the need to restore because of many global issues of the 20th century, 21st century, including food and nutritional security, mitigating and adapting climate change, improving quality and renewability of water resources, enhancing biodiversity, improving human well-being and ending poverty, and most of these, as we know, are now listed amongst the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations or the Agenda 2030. These global issues are likely to be exacerbated by the growth of the world population, increase in the influence of the lifestyle, and the growing urbanization. And many of these issues were presented at the excellent conference that Professor Ildefonso Placentis and his colleague has organized. We know, for example, from the presentation by many colleagues that there are almost 800 million food insecure people in the world and an additional two to three billion who are prone to malnutrition and hidden hunger. And it's important concept that came out even in the uh, summary report presented by Professor Placentis and distributed and one statement there, which is very important, I'll repeat, the health of soil, plants, animals, people, and ecosystems is one and indivisible. Therefore, health of soil is important to the health of nature. Global urbanization is another anthropogenic force of the 21st century. Urban population as percent of the total was only 2% in 1800, 14% in 1900, 30% in 1950, 50% 50 in 2008, and is projected to be 61% in 2030, 66% in 2050, 76% in 2075, and 84% in 2400. The number of mega cities, cities greater than 10 million people, was three in 1975, 10 in 1990, 16 in 2000, 28 in 2015, 31 in 2016, and will be 37 in 2025, 41 in 2030, 50 in 2050, 70 in 2075, and 83 mega cities in 2100. One of the largest megacity in 2100 will be Lagos, Nigeria, 
with a projected population of 83 million. It takes 40,000 hectares to provide accommodation and infrastructure to 1 million people. An annual increase of the world population by 75 million takes 3 million hectares of prime agricultural land out of production. In the United States, each kilometer of interstate highway can promote 100 to 120 hectare of suburban growth. Therefore, urbanization is an important factor. Mega cities of 10 million require 6,000 tons of food per day. All the nutrients, especially phosphorus, coming into these mega cities, if it's not properly managed, it becomes a great liability as we have seen even in a presentation today about the algal bloom, which is a major issue to be considered. Soils of agroecosystems are highly vulnerable to degradation. Thanks to the work, Professor Placentis and others, uh, erosion, depletion of soil organic carbon, salinization, which has been his subject of specialization, and many other forms of physical, chemical, biological degradation are really taking a very serious toll on very finite and limited resources of the world. Therefore, restoration of soil health is essential to enhancing the agronomic productivity and improving the food security. Let's think for a moment. 38% of the Earth's terrestrial surface is used for agriculture. 75% of agricultural land almost 4 billion hectares, is allocated raising animals. 70% of the global freshwater withdrawals are used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are contributed by agriculture. And yet, one in nine person is food insecure. And yet, two to three person in seven are malnourished. Therefore, it is about the time to think how can we improve agriculture? How can we make agriculture a solution to the problem, not a problem? Because without agriculture, we cannot survive. Therefore, we might as well make it as an important part of the solution. And there are several options of achieving that solution. Important among these are reducing food waste which is 30 to 40 percent globally, even in the United States. Increasing access to food by addressing poverty, inequality, and political instability. Improving distribution. Increasing use of pulses and plant-based food rather than animal-based food. Identifying alternate sources of protein. Accepting personal responsibility. Each one of us has a responsibility. We are culprit as well as victims of the environmental issues. And of course, increasing productivity from the existing land. The solution of bringing more land under agriculture, more irrigation, is not an option. Humans are only one of the 8.7 million species, and yet we appropriate 40% of the total production. Therefore, sustainable intensification of the strategy of producing more from less, less land, less water, less input of fertilizer and pesticide, less use of energy, less emission of green, that is the strategy we have to take. There are three basic principles of sustainability. Replace whatever you remove from soil. Respond wisely to whatever we change and predict what will happen by anthropogenic and other perturbation and do something to manage those changes that may happen. The question of sustainability was discussed today. Sustainability was very rightly pointed out this afternoon has four pillars, environmental, economic, social, and institutional. I want to emphasize the role of institution. The university such as yours has a very important role to play in institutional sustainability. <clears throat> Landscape and soil, when you look at them, and I had the privilege of seeing some of the field that 
Professor Plasanti showed me the other day, landscape and soil are mirror images of the people living on them. <clears throat> when people are poverty stricken, miserable, hungry, and desperate, they pass their sufferings to the land, therefore improving the well-being of people and meeting their basic necessity is the solution to improving the land resources. <clears throat> Healthy soils are also integral to mitigating global warming. COP21 in Paris adopted the program Cather per mill, carbon sequestration in soils at the rate of 0.4% per year. This is the first time any policymaker had translated science into action. International Union of Soil Science commended him and honored him with a distinguished service medal that I had the privilege to present him and also to the Environment Minister of Germany, uh, Professor uh, Klaus Tuffer, who received a same medal. Healthy soils are also essential to achieving global peace and stability. I want to emphasize that because degrading soils, recurring drought, low crop yields, perpetual poverty and hunger, desperateness and marginal living are as real threat to global peace and security as our ICBM and nuclear weapon proliferation. So improving soil health is essential to achieving global peace. I want to state at this point Mahatma Gandhi <clears throat> who outlined seven sins of humanity. Number one, wealth without work. Number two, pleasure without conscience. Number three, knowledge without character. Number four, commerce without morality. Number five, politics without principles. It's a very important statement. Number six, religion without sacrifice. Number seven, science without humanity. Humanity and science go together. Science properly managed can serve humanity. If we consider some of the global situation today, every, every minute, what is happening in the world at the moment, death from hunger, 60 every minute, deforestation, 25 hectare every minute, fresh water withdrawal, six and a half million cubic meter every minute, energy consumption, 1.1 petajoules every minute, new motor vehicles on the road, 160 every minute, urban encroachment, seven hectare every minute, soil degradation, 10 hectare every minute, CO2 emission, 20 gigagram every minute. If Gandhi were to see the state of the world at this time, I wonder if he would have increased the list to of the sins of humanity. I think it's anybody's guess, but if I were to suggest what Gandhi would have done, I think he would have added number eight, technology without wisdom. Number nine, education without relevance. Very important. In our universities, our education must be relevant to address societal needs. And I dare say, humanity without regard to soil and its restoration, which is very critical. Toward the end, as I mentioned during our lunchtime, I want to share a poem with you. It's not written by me, but I truly believe in what it is. And the poem says something like this. An old man going down a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and wide and steep with waters running cold and deep. The old man crossed in the twilight dim for the sullen stream had no fear for him. But he paused when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a friendly pilgrim near, you are wasting your time in a building here. 
your journey will end with the evening day and you never again shall pass this way you have crossed the chasm deep and wide why build this bridge at even tide the old man replied good friend on the path i have trodden today comes a fair haired youth who must pass this way the chasm that meant not to me to the fair haired youth might a pitfall be he too must cross in the twilight then good friend i'm building this bridge for him we have responsibility for the coming generation i'm delighted honored privileged to be here thank you for this honor this will be remembered in my family for generation to come thank you La humanitat sempre ha estat preocupada pel seu futur. L'ésser humà sap que el seu present és en gran mesura la conseqüència del seu passat. 
però es pregunta especialment per com seguim sent humà creant cada dia el seu present futur. És veritat que li donem gran importància al pretèrit, però fins i tot aquest ho és freqüentment com un camp d'experiència que ens ha de servir per pensar i programar el nostre futur curt i el nostre futur llarg. Veiem el passat com un gran magisteri per la vida present i pel nostre esdevenidor. Es pensa a vegades que els historiadors són els encarregats de guardar la memòria del passat. No crec que sigui aquesta la tasca fonamental dels historiadors com a científics socials. És més, els aconsello que desconfiïn vostès quan sentin la paraula memòria referida a un bon coneixement del passat. Els historiadors en realitat responen a una necessitat dels humans que consisteix a conèixer si hi ha alguna regularitat amb el nostre comportament en col·lectivitat. Els historiadors tracten, tractem d'analitzar si el funcionament i canvi de les societats obeixen a regularitats que una vegada identificades i conegudes ens permeten estar en disposició d'actuar sobre la planificació del nostre demà col·lectiu. Incluem, és clar, a la regularitat de l'atxar que sabem que existeix tot i que encara no sabem com funciona. Els historiadors fem ciència per ajudar a entendre i dominar el canvi social que ens ha de conduir al nostre millor futur. Todo lo anterior viene a colación por una idea que me parece central en la personalidad y la trayectoria de nuestro doctor honoris causa Ratan Lal. A saber, la ciencia no es solo un motor fundamental para el cambio, sino que es un tipo de conocimiento de la realidad que aspira a encontrar regularidades de la naturaleza y de la sociedad para poder dominar nuestro futuro. El futuro de la humanidad está, pues, siempre presente en la ciencia. Y eso es particularmente evidente en el caso de aquellos científicos que se dedican a analizar cómo el planeta va a seguir teniendo la posibilidad de existir y cómo la humanidad no lo va a impedir con sus propias actuaciones. Aquí se establece una dialéctica muy importante entre las regularidades propias de la naturaleza y las regularidades propias del comportamiento de la condición humana en sociedad. Por eso me parece evidente que los científicos que analizan la naturaleza y los científicos que analizan la sociedad y la quieren comprender deben colaborar con mayor intensidad para proponer las bases que debemos establecer en nuestro modelo de sociedad para que la extinción de los humanos o del planeta no sea responsabilidad de los primeros. Y como hablamos de responsabilidad, es evidente que los filósofos de la moral también tienen grandes aportaciones que hacer, pues el comportamiento del humano es siempre axiológico, o sea, pleno de juicios de valores morales. Aquí la ética es imprescindible para establecer el necesario debate acerca de en qué valores morales debemos sustentar nuestros modelos de sociedad, es decir, a qué debemos aspirar y a qué debemos renunciar, es un dilema que incumbe a la reflexión ética. No basta con el conocimiento científico de la realidad, no basta con las predicciones de futuro basadas en la ciencia, sino que a partir de esas bases objetivas debemos reflexionar sobre los valores que deben alumbrar nuestra vida colectiva. Son los valores, más que la tecnología, lo que van a decidir qué futuro vamos a vivir e incluso si vamos a tener futuro. Pienso que la monumental obra científica y cívica de Ratan Lal obedece a estas premisas que acabo de desarrollar brevemente. Si repasamos su formidable currículum podemos apreciar que en su trayectoria hay un claro impulso cívico y ético que le lleva a un compromiso ecuménico con la humanidad y con el planeta. 
Como debo reconocer que no conozco en profundidad su personalidad, no sé si fue la ciencia la que le condujo a la ética o fue la ética la que le impulsó a ser un científico. O quizá simplemente ver los fértiles suelos de su India natal. Con todo, no es la cuestión principal. La cuestión principal es que Ratan Lal investiga porque está emocionalmente preocupado por el porvenir de sus congéneres, actuales y futuros. No se escandalicen ustedes si les digo que hay corrientes de pensamiento que justifican que no debe importarnos el futuro de la especie humana, dado que la vida no tiene ningún sentido y que lo realmente significativo es la existencia individual, que es única e irrepetible y que, en consecuencia, no tenemos por qué asumir responsabilidades sobre el futuro de los humanos. En aras a la libertad de pensamiento, nada tengo que decir contra el nihilismo existencial, salvo que me proclamo abiertamente contrario a él, porque, entre otras cosas, si todos pensáramos igual, es bien cierto que entonces es mucho más que probable que ni siquiera hubiéramos llegado hasta aquí. Estoy seguro que Ratan Lal no comparte las ideas nihilistas. Más bien, me atrevo a afirmar que comparte la idea contraria del vitalismo comprometido. Cada generación es responsable de gestionar el legado de las generaciones anteriores para mejorarlo y dejar una herencia mejor a las siguientes. Todos los humanos, individual y colectivamente, somos herederos, hacedores y legatarios de sociedad. Todos nos subimos a las espaldas de las generaciones anteriores, creamos realidad social y legamos nuestras obras y las del pasado a quienes siguen la cadena de la supervivencia de la especie. Y en ese legar un buen patrimonio para el futuro, la tarea de científicos como Ratan Lal es sencillamente fundamental. Sin ellos no podríamos conocer objetivamente la realidad para de esta manera poder proponer las buenas acciones que aseguren la supervivencia de la especie y del planeta. Como diría nuestro querido rector Jaume Porta, que por desgracia no ha podido acompañarnos por un problema momentáneo de salud, debemos conocer el suelo, sus propiedades y sus comportamientos, porque en ello nos va la supervivencia alimentaria, es decir, nuestra perpetuación biológica como especie. Una supervivencia que Ratan Lal ha demostrado que depende del uso racional y eficiente de las tierras y del agua para lograr su conservación en aras a la producción eficaz de alimentos de calidad y de un medio ambiente biodiverso capaz de ser sostenible de forma indefinida. Ahora bien, la ciencia por sí sola no asegura el bien de la humanidad ni el futuro del planeta. La ciencia puede demostrarnos empíricamente o con modelos matemáticos cuál es la realidad actual y predecir con modestia en qué sentido puede desarrollarse en el futuro el comportamiento de la Tierra como sistema global e interdependiente. Pero lo que no puede hacer la ciencia es sustituir a la responsabilidad política. Creo que por esta razón que Ratan Lal ha tenido siempre una clara conciencia que el conocimiento científico debía complementarse con el compromiso cívico y el activismo político. Los estudios medioambientales deben vincularse con políticas medioambientales. Ciencia y política, como siempre, deben dialogar y matrimoniarse. La política debe escuchar a la ciencia, pero la ciencia debe interpelar a la política. Para tomar buenas decisiones políticas necesitamos ciencia, pero la ciencia debe partir también de las necesidades sociales y ser estimulada por las decisiones de la moral y de la política. Cuando en, 1200, cuando, perdón, cuando en 2007 se entrega el Premio Nobel de la Paz a Al Gore 
y al Grupo Intergubernamental de Expertos en el Cambio Climático y con ello a Ratan Lal, se está haciendo un reconocimiento universal a ese matrimonio entre ciencia y política o entre política y ciencia. Una nueva política que tendrá necesariamente que volver a discutir las nociones de crecimiento económico, distribución de la riqueza social y territorial, calidad de vida sostenible, responsabilidad histórica de las generaciones y felicidad humana. Pero a la gran política hay que estimularla desde las asociaciones y las instituciones científicas, profesionales y sociales. Un trabajo institucional de las aso asociaciones que reúne a los científicos para debatir entre ellos, a los estudiosos y a los políticos para confeccionar programas de actuación y también para la imprescindible tarea de concienciar a la sociedad de los grandes retos y las necesidades de buscar soluciones concretas, globales y sostenibles a la vez. Si me permiten, diré que tan importante como investigar para conseguir conocimiento nuevo es transmitir los resultados para concienciar a las poblaciones humanas de los reales e inminentes peligros que corre nuestro planeta. Una tarea en la que también ha destacado nuestro doctor Honoris Causa, que siempre ha visto con meridiana claridad la necesidad de participar e impulsar asociaciones y congresos, como felizmente el celebrado estos días en nuestra universidad y que aprovecho ahora la ocasión para felicitar a sus organizadores, con especial mención para el profesor Ildefons Pla y la profesora Rosa María Poc. Sin embargo, la imprescindible tarea de concienciar a los ciudadanos de que las evidencias científicas sobre el futuro del planeta deben hacerles reflexionar sobre la necesidad de reformar o cambiar el modelo de sociedad, resulta, la experiencia nos lo dice, una labor plena de dificultades. Desde los primeros movimientos conservacionistas del siglo de la Ilustración, en torno a los bosques y a las artes de pesca, hasta los acuerdos de 195 países en París el 12 de diciembre de 2015, las voces que claman por un sistema social que respete y conserve a la gran madre Gaia ha topado con demasiadas indiferencias por parte no solo de los políticos, sino también de una gran mayoría de ciudadanos. Es verdad que en la actualidad las cosas han mejorado notablemente, pero no podemos relajarnos porque siempre habrá un Donald Trump entre nosotros que será por ignorancia o porque defenderá los intereses de los poderosos los que nos dejará el legado de un mal futuro. Y no podemos relajarnos porque la diferencia entre la capacidad de deterioro del medio ambiente que tuvo la primera revolución industrial y la que provoca el actual sistema productivo, nada tienen que ver. No creo que sea exagerado afirmar que estamos ante la última oportunidad de salvar nuestra existencia como especie en un planeta regenerado. Tengamos esperanza en que la racionalidad, la inteligencia y el miedo a desaparecer sean los que triunfen. Pero acompañemos nuestra esperanza con el activismo social y político que debería tener en las universidades una gran caja de resonancia. Y acompañemos también nuestra esperanza con algo de temor, algo de temor, siempre necesario en la vida social para no acometer empresas que acaben con nuestra colectividad humana. Hace un par de años estuve en un viaje rectoral a China visitando varias universidades. Pues bien, en una semana, desde Pekín a Shanghái, no pude ver el cielo, oculto como estaba en una indefinida masa blanca. Entiendo perfectamente que las autoridades chinas quieran sacar a sus ciudadanos de la miseria y situarlos en la clase media. Pero a lo mejor, en su loable intento, se quedan sin país y sin ciudadanos. Las autoridades chinas, y no solo ellas, ciertamente, deberían tener temor a las consecuencias finales de sus políticas de desarrollismo industrial acelerado. Vayamos concluyendo. 
Creo que la gran lección cívica del profesor Ratan Lal es que la ciencia sirve para mejorar la sociedad a condición de que le hagamos caso. Y eso quiere decir que cualquier modelo de crecimiento económico y desarrollo social que no contenga en su seno la perspectiva medioambiental pondrá en peligro la propia existencia de lo humano. El suelo, el agua y el aire siguen siendo miles de años después de que nos transformásemos en humanos nuestro principal capital para crear una civilización humana perdurable. Querido y admirado profesor, por demostrarnos científicamente esta evidencia y por luchar para que todos la conozcamos, usted forma parte de quienes hacen que la vida sea mejor para todos los demás. Y por ello es para toda la comunidad universitaria lezana un verdadero honor que usted figure a partir de hoy en nuestro claustro de profesores. Confío en que seremos dignos de su generosidad y de su grandeza. Muchísimas gracias, Ratán Lal.